All right. All right. Stop what you're doing, because I'm about to ruin the image and the style that you're used to. Oh, a little Humpty Dance, get everyone's attention. There we go. <laughs> Except Jacob. Jacob, he's, he's a focused guy. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, everyone had a good lunch, good conversation. We're going to begin the afternoon portion of the program here uh, with me uh, to kick things off. We have Lewis Bear with Reclamation District 108 and Barry O'Regan with KSN. And they're going to be talking about the outreach efforts that they're engaged in through the Floodplains Reimagine program. So I will let them take it away. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here and online. So the focus of this really is, you know, you've heard from Jacob how important puddles are and you've heard from Carson, all the big science words that also said uh, puddles are important as well. So uh, so we're convinced, right? Um, the other thing that convinces me personally is this is how it used to work for fish, right? So fish used to spread out on the floodplains. This is how it worked when we had an abundance of fish. And so um, at RD 108, we sort of pride ourselves on taking care of our own valley and our own backyard. It's ours, right? And we want it to be healthy. Um, we are on the Sacramento River right in the heart of the floodplain. And our board members really, really take that seriously. This is where they wanna raise their kids and families and they wanna be proud of that. So uh, we, we, uh, we actually reached down close to Yolo Bypass. And so we participated early on in the Yolo Bypass process. Um, some of my board members are good friends with other folks that were in the Yolo Bypass as well. And I'm sure many of you are very fam familiar with the Yolo Bypass process. But it was, uh, you know, it was a biological opinion um, put upon the federal and state agencies to go out and to, you know, achieve 17,000 acres of habitat. That was really difficult for the landowners. It really wasn't a program that was designed to support the landowners to help take care of their footprint. It was, you know, lots of science and modeling and things that were happening to them and they didn't have a way to, to sort of marry into that process. And I think it produced conflict, um, I hope unnecessarily. Um, it ended up, you know, where it is now, two decades later, um, you know, finally things I think are happening, um, but it's still, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of angst. Um, a lot of the landowners are upset because they feel like it was something that was done to them. So you'll hear from David Guy next, and David's part of my inspiration, frankly. He's got the Sacramento Valley with Northern California Water Association in a position where they're thinking about taking care of their own backyard and doing innovative things and fixing their own problems. You've probably heard the fix, not the fight, but that's really the culture in the Sac Valley. So we sort of took what we saw happen in Yolo Bypass and said, what if we empowered the landowners to do good things in their own backyard? We brought them the tools that the state and federal agencies were using. Um, we brought them the science and the understanding um, and they personally brought their own love and passion for the land and their understanding for how the landscape worked. And we charged them with trying to improve this landscape. And that essentially is what I'll describe to you uh, right now along with Barry, that is the floodplain reimagined program. So at the very beginning of floodplain reimagined, we, uh, we, um, we laid out the priorities. We invited everybody and we said, hey, look, um, same speech I just gave you, but above the Yolo Bypass, we have all of these historic floodplains. So what are our priorities? And they're not just fish, right? I mean, we have Sigma that folks in the Valley are dealing with. Um, we care deeply, like Mark suggested, with hunting and waterfowl, um, other species, giant garter snakes. Um, we have a robust Valley of you know, different terrestrial species and aquatic species. And, we want to take care of all of those. Um, flood protection is essential for us um, in our way of life and our small communities. All of those things, we want to be able to take a look at those and we want to reimagine them with what we understand today. So these are the priorities that the group came up with. 
So we wanted to do that in a little bit of a different way. So this is the construct or the foundational principles. We want to understand all of the parties' interests that are at the table. So the fish agencies are at the table, state and federal, the Bureau of Reclamation, um, the Corps of Engineers, uh, the private wetland managers. Everybody agreed that they're going to try to understand each other's challenges and solve it from others' perspectives. So that was a foundational principle. Um, the second bubble here talks about mutual respect. So we recognize that these other important um, products on this landscape have value and we respect that. So the middle one is sort of a, we're going to respect each other, but we're gonna get stuff done. And so we were hopeful that this voluntary process of working together could expedite the delivery of products and kind of re-envisioning. We were going to respect existing land uses. And the way we're gonna do that is that this is an entirely voluntary program. So if there's a project that one of the landowners that's affected doesn't agree with, it doesn't happen. And so that's a little bit possible because of sort of the carrot and the stick that we have going on in our world right now with the state board process. Um, but I would say it's sort of a healthy amount of pressure that's encouraging folks to think about how to be productive. But at the same time, um, folks are doing things within the constraints of their existing uses. And you heard you know, Mark Petrie talk about private wetlands and duck hunting and Quite often, people get really concerned that a project is going to, you know, offset one of the other benefits. So we're sort of working within that space before you get to that point. Um, but you'll find that there's quite a bit of opportunity. One of the reasons that there's quite a bit of opportunity is you saw Jacob put the, I think he had six circles and, you know, the American Basin and the, um, Yolo Basin, you know, were filled with houses. Well, no, American and Sacramento basins were filled with houses. You had Yolo Bypass that's happening with, um, you know, the program that's been going on there. But you also had three basins upstream of that. You had the Sutter, the Butte, and the Calusa. And that is the footprint of floodplain reimagined. So Yolo Bypass is about 40,000 acres, roughly. Um, the footprint that you see on the map behind me is about 500,000 acres, 750 square miles of individual landowners and people that we're working with in the landscape. So when Jacob talked about landscape scale, this is where it's at, right? I mean, if we have an opportunity to really change the Sacramento and the Feather and Butte Creek, this is, this is where it's at. There's, this is the landscape that used to be our historical floodplains. Almost every single map that you saw today that flood, you know, faded in and out from historic bypasses, this is what's remaining. This is what's out there today. It's also the map that Mark showed on the most important waterfowl habitat in this valley. So um, it's a complex footprint, but it's full of opportunity. So I wanted to spend some time um, just going over the fact that we are not new to planning and thinking about this footprint. Um, three slides here full of other programs that are looking at this footprint. As folks have started to understand the importance of the science um, and the opportunity here and the fact that this is a missing life stage for our fishery and that that fishery is compromising our water supply reliability, folks have really started to focus on this. There are a number of major programs. There's three slides full of programs that are all thinking about um, this exact same footprint. What many of them are not set up to do is to take action. And so that's what Floodplain Reimagine is all about. It's about moving from the important things that we wanna do for these multiple benefits to projects that can be deployed in our landscape and doing in that a way, in a way that's respectful of the fact that the land is already being used for lots of different things. So the, that's the third one. So here's the structure of the program. So RD-108 is simply the fiscal agent. We have no other authorities or roles in this program. 
We've hired a program team that frankly I think is the best in California. KSN and Barry here are program managers um, along with Holly Dolly and uh, they do an amazing job. We have a facilitation team with Kearns and West that is just terrific at bringing everybody out. We have the technical experts at CBEC that are helping us with modeling. They're the same ones that did all the work for YOLO. Um, and then we have been able to utilize the relationships from kind of the irrigation districts and the farmers on the landscape to bring the farmers into that process early. And they are the central part of that process. So not much different than YOLO. We formed a, a, you know, some technical advisory groups. Those groups have developed all of the you know, fishery science and floodplain work and groundwater recharge standards and the bird standards with help from DU. Um, and then they bring those to what we call our advisory committee. And our advisory committee is an open to everybody just like the technical groups, open to anybody that's willing to attend. Um, and we've had great attendance, 50 plus in most of our meetings. Um, and then the decision-making body, because we were gonna be about action, was 11 folks. And it includes the farmers, it includes the state and federal agencies, it includes the NGOs, and it includes the tribes. And so everybody has a voice on that steering committee. And the steering committee basically decides how to allocate assets for project development, so which Barry's going to talk about a little bit later here. So, so that's the structure of the program. So phase one of the program um, was funded through a Prop 68 uh, agreement um, from Natural Resources. What's that? Oh, on the wrong one. So that was the initial $6 million that funded this program. About $3 million, you can imagine the two-dimensional modeling to move water across this landscape. It's about half of that initial budget. Most of the rest of the budget was bringing people together, creating these conversations, documenting those conversations, and putting them into an initial report. Although we did start our initial technical service outreach um, in that program. Our phase two, which is kind of where we're transitioning into right now, is funded um, in part by what you'll hear from David Guy later and the Floodplain Forward Group. Um, but that funding is almost entirely being focused on project development and technical services for landowners to deliver these projects. So what do we do? Um, I think of it as really three things that we're considering as physical changes on the landscape. And that is, we look at the river connection. And this is, you know, it's might be abstract for a lot of folks that aren't on the Sacramento River all the time. But there are a number of places where the river still connects with the floodplains. Um, an example, uh, like Fremont Weir is Tisdale Weir. Tisdale Weir currently on average connects with the floodplain, about 15,000 acres, about 45 days a year. So that's because, you know, it tries to hold the water within the channel so the land could be farmed. That was the original purpose. We were trying to feed the folks that were settling in California. DWR is currently proposing a notch. The notch would only be permitted for upstream adult passage into the Sacramento River. With that notch, if you operated it differently than the adult notch proposed operation, if you operated it thinking about floodplains downstream and you worked with those landowners downstream, you could connect that river to the floodplain twice as many days on average during the winter. So 90 days instead of 45 days. The difference in the river is that it would connect to the landscape at about 20% of capacity. Currently connects to the landscape at about 80% of capacity. These examples like this are essentially how our rivers used to work or closer to that compared to what we've done with our flood control system. So this is a mechanical change in our flood control system that would double the number of days that we would connect our river to the landscape. So those are our river connections. Um, there are multiple more. There's things like the Knight's Landing outfall gates and the uh, Butte Slough outfall gates. There's the Molten Weir, the Calusa Weir. 
There's three weirs at the top of the, the Butte Basin. There are potential to connect the Calusa Basin, which currently doesn't have any connection or fish access. So these are all the historic um, floodplain footprints. And with this floodplain reimagined conversation or program, we've been able to fund landowners to consider what they might do. And so I think that has been enlightening and really exciting to be a part of these conversations. So I shared the one example with you um, on a river connection. I'd like to share with you kind of the second thing we consider. And that's similar to what um, Paul Butner talked to you about, and it's remanaging your property, thinking about fishery benefits, right? We had a, a very exciting meeting just Saturday with the uh, uh, Butte Sink um, Water Association. And this is frankly, if you ever have a chance just to drive up through the Butte Sink, it's some of the beautiful, most beautiful country um, in California. It's wetlands like they were naturally. Um, there's trees, there's waterfowl. Um, it's just absolutely beautiful. And we met with those folks and we said, hey, look, these are important things um, for the fishery. And this is a group of folks that tend to be really connected to wildlife. They, they love wildlife. They're out there a lot of times just to be in the middle of this place that's so beautiful. They were worried also. It is, I, I don't know if Mark can vouch for it, I think it's probably the best place to, uh, to hunt waterfowl, period, um, or it's close enough to it that uh, nobody's gonna, gonna contest it. But so it, it's very threatening to them to consider you know, a change to their landscape. Um, a lot of people refer, them to, refer to them as billionaires with guns. I mean, it's, the locals can't afford to hunt there, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful and pristine. And yet here's this program that could be threatening that hunting landscape. And so we met with them and we talked with them about this program. And by the end of the meeting, they agreed to apply for technical services as the association of all of the duck clubs there so that they could tell their story and they can look for ways to improve their landscape, even though they're doing an amazing job. They're, they're a big part of the reason why Butte Creek um, is kind of the stronghold for Spring Run right now. And so um, it's that sort of kind of ground up cooperation that's really inspiring with this program. And then the final example, so we've talked about river connections and land management, but there's a whole corridor within these floodplains on how water moves. And you know, it was kind of designed by happenstance, right? We built levees and the borrow pits became the flowways. People started farming and putting in irrigation canals, this sort of thing. It wasn't designed for adults to move upstream or juveniles to move downstream. And so with this program, we're able to meet with the landowners, bring in the fishery understanding. We have biologists as part of our team and basically evaluate that and say, well, from a fish passage um, consideration, what would we do there? So those are kind of the three different pieces that we provide for the landowners, along with sort of putting that into a package so that they can market that to state and federal agencies that are um, looking for those sorts of assets. And so um, that's, uh, that's really what this program is all about. And I keep forgetting that. Switch my slides. And so this is a slide just looking at the types of actions that I just described. The one other thing that I don't want to leave out is that we also believe that the river is super important. 80% um, of our fish roughly are still in the river. And so with this program, we've, we've sort of combined the on-channel and off-channel habitat. And so we've been able to do some work um, flying the landscape during floods and as floods recede and share that information with other folks like river partners and cow trout so that they can look at opportunities on the river um, to complement this off-channel habitat. So I think with that, I'll hand it over to Barry to go through some of the, uh, the landscape actions that are happening. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, my name is Barry O'Regan. Thanks for having us here. These were some slides I showed. Some of the, uh, Lewis talked about the river connections. These show some of the river connections. This is the Butte Basin. 
um, where you can see we have a number of opportunities there potentially to reconnect the river uh, with more frequency. And here Lewis talked about the Calusa Basin again, some kind of cutting edge thinking here that Lewis has been pushing on how we could utilize the Calusa Basin in a way that hasn't been used since, since uh, settlement for fish. And then again, the Sutter Bypass, which I think is one of the building success stories of this program that we can talk about a little bit more later. Technical assistance. So when Lewis called me, he said, look, I want to put this program together. Um, he said the most important thing in this program has to be technical assistance to landowners. Because in our careers, we've been involved in a lot of large studies, uh, programs uh, that were top down. Right? And though well intentioned those top down studies are, um, they can be frustrating as a local to participate in. And ultimately, they end up being often ineffective because it's like that old joke about breakfast, right? The chicken's involved, but the pig is committed. And when you, you're part of a large, part of a large study, sure, you're involved, but you're really not committed to what, what the effort is. So, um, we wanted to make sure that we could get voluntary commitment to get this done. Because we're talking about half a million acres. One agency can't do that. We need the landowners, we need the land managers to f implement this program. And Lewis will talk briefly about building capacity at the end. So we're, I'm getting this, the, the bat signal here, so we'll have to hurry up. So we, we developed this process for technical assistance where um, we want to provide a, a, access to information and technical and science to the landowners so they can move forward with the things they want to do on their land. Lewis talked about the meeting on, on Saturday. I was a little bit apprehensive, to be perfectly frank, about going out there, and I thought we were going to get beat up a little bit, but I was taken aback by the excitement when we talked about the technical assistance uh, approach, where people felt they could get in, get the technical expertise they need to develop some of the things that they want to do with their property, with the overall arching goals of our program. So we're really excited about it. And what, the way it works is we work with the landowners to scope. They bring us an idea. We help them scope it out. We introduce them to the available information. We take that back to the steering committee that Lewis talked about. The steering committee reviews that information or that proposal and then decides whether they're funded or not. And the landowners, land managers can use their own experts or they can access the technical team, whichever they prefer. And it's really building that trust to move forward. I think the Sutter Bypass is a really good example of that. So we had a top-down planning process in the Sutter Bypass that, while again, while well-intentioned, really put the landowners at odds with the agency pushing that project forward. And so they utilized the technical assistance to better understand what the potential impacts to their property might be. And we went from over my dead body to, you know, some level of acceptance right now, and actually, some, and also excitement. And some of the landowners that, that Paul talked about earlier were part of that group, and now they're out there doing amazing experiments and science on their property that's really pushing, pushing the ball forward on how we can help this uh, species. And I think technical assistance played a huge part in that because they were able to get in and understand the detail and feel like that they were in control of that process rather than being told about it. So we, we went from attorneys sending letters to the agency saying, hey, we're not sure about this, to the, to the point where we're now submitting grant applications on their behalf to get this work done. And that was through technical assistance. And we're working with landlords. We're also working with, with NGOs. Lewis mentioned Ducks and, uh, River Partners. We're also working with Ducks Unlimited funding some work that they want to do. Dan is working through technical assistance funding from this program to advance some of his hypotheses. And we also have landowners lined up to, take, to participate uh, in, in the next phase of this project. So we're really excited about it. I'll hand it back to Lewis. He can, can sum up on the value of this program. It's great. <laughs> I thought we were out of time, but sorry. No. You know what, what I get excited about is uh, What's that? Oh, is there something else? All right. Hey, good job, Barry. Um, now, I, to me, I mean, if uh, if you were involved in Yolo Bypass or even the Tisdale Adult Notch, um, 
imagine a world where the landowners downstream are the ones proposing the project that you're writing the CEQA document for. And imagine actually sleeping through the night without any problems after that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, to me, if you can get to that level of trust and excitement with the landowners that I frankly think we have right now, um, you're there. I think you have something that's going to happen. And uh, that's the intent of this program. So, um, you know, having all the, the people involved with these projects at the table has been really important. Um, I just spoke to the landowner outreach, but um, tribal engagement. Uh, we have uh, one seat on the steering committee for the tribes. Um, it's been a great learning experience for all of us. You know, they've highlighted things that are important to show and not show on a lot of the mapping and different things that we've produced. Um, we have struggled a little bit. Our tribal representative has now stepped off the steering committee um, because they moved on from their position. Um, and a lot of the tribes in the valley don't have the capacity to have somebody engage that much. And so we, uh, we'd really like to have more engagement and we hope that that changes soon. Um, we've had great involvement from the agencies. And I think part of that is because all those other programs that you were seeing, there's lots of folks that understand how important this floodplain work is. So terrific involvement and engagement and relationship building there that's so important. Um, you know, the agencies are learning about the landscape and farmers' property and what they do, and the landowners are getting to know folks and realizing they're regular people and they intend to do good things, and, and that relationship building is super important. Um, the understanding, uh, you know, landowners, um, they're farmers, a lot of them are wetland managers, right? So they don't necessarily understand the right things that they need to do for the fishery or for some of these other benefits. We've been able to provide that to them in the easiest and simplest way uh, for them to engage with the least amount of their resources. And so I think that's been really helpful. And then finally, building capacity. So when you think about 750 square miles of landscape and the fact that you're going to rethink this, you know, it took us... 150 years to modify this landscape, right? Or at least 50 to do most of the, the work. Um, it's gonna take a while to get out of this. And so that doesn't mean that we don't start doing things right away, but we start learning right away. Um, there are, you know, the, Barry mentioned the, the Sutter Bypass and that group of landowners. 12,000 acres of property owners that are ready to move forward. So. That's amazing, right? That's a project that could happen in a couple of years, not 20 years or not a longer time period. We can learn from that. We now have technical services being applied for all the way up the Sutter Bypass to the Butte Sink. So it's not a mystery anymore who those folks are. They're talking to us. They're having tours on their land. They're ready to work with us. And so to me, that's, that's the door being open. That's the excitement that we can achieve landscape level change. Um, and I just look forward to spending the rest of my career trying to get some of that stuff done. So, okay, thanks everybody. I'd be happy to answer questions if you, you'd like, Todd. Great, thanks Lewis, appreciate it. And thanks Barry. Um, we have a question here with, from Mark. Lewis or Barry, um, you mentioned the technical assistance with the uh, uh, Butte Sink Club owners. Yeah. What was the nature of that technical assistance they're, they're interested in that relate to the whole floodplains reimagined thing? Yeah, so they have an amazing story to tell on their own. And so some of the services that we can provide are, you know, just helping them tell that story with maps and documenting all of that. They also see things that they can do over and above what they're doing right now. They think fish food is a real possibility. That yellow window that you pointed out, they think that's a real asset of their property that doesn't exist uh, in farmed areas. Um, they also believe that some of their internal infrastructure could be improved to better benefit fish. And what we're gonna be able to do for them is sort of write that up. Um, one of the things that they're very worried about is uh, the, the vulnerability of their water supply um, with the proposed unimpaired flow approach at the state board and how that might limit some of the rice ground um, and limit some of their water supply because a lot of that is flow from rice ground upstream. So 
that's sort of their carrot and stick. Um, the stick is that they're worried about their water supply. Um, yeah, also too, I think one of the things they were excited about is I think cow, fish, and wildlife have had concerns about volitional passage in that area. And so they were interested in, in maybe uh, being able to talk a little bit more about that and show that in their minds it's not an issue. Um, so talk a little bit about that and help maybe with some of the modeling that we've done and some of the science we've developed that we can work uh, to, to answer that question. <laughs> All right, well, to close out here, um, we're going to have uh, David Guy with the Northern California Water Association. He's going to be providing an overview of the collaborative partnership that is the Floodplains Forward Coalition and the work that the coalition is doing to advance a lot of the work that you've been hearing about today. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thanks. All right, thanks, Todd. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good lunch? It's that time of day where everybody's starting to like slip into that like happy place. I know where you guys are going. Somebody over here I just heard was in Aruba. Is that true? Were you in Aruba? No? No? Tahiti? All right, whatever. Yeah, let's go back to the Sacramento Valley and uh, that special place. So, uh, well, hey, it's great to kind of have the opportunity to share a stage today with, boy, some of the people that uh, just truly uh, enjoy working with, truly value their contributions to to the state of California, and I'm just going to try to capture some of that uh, if I can uh, today, so, and try to maybe summarize some of the things we've heard today. Um, I first just want to thank uh, Linda in the back of the room, uh, thank Darcy, Todd, for putting this all together. Uh, these things are always a lot of effort, so thank you guys for all that, and I know some others, too, who probably uh, uh, really contributed, so thank you. It's been a really enjoyable uh, day. Um, also, want to just uh, to uh, you heard earlier about some of the science, and I'm going to obviously pick up on that, try to distill that. But I always uh, think backwards, and I think there's a couple people I want to acknowledge who contributed, I think, so much to this dynamic, and they're not here today. But uh, I think I think of people like Huey Johnson. Um, Jacob uh, spoke uh, with him uh, many times about this. Uh, Dale Hall, of course, uh, was U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service director, Ducks Unlimited. Uh, Ted Summer uh, has already been mentioned, and then I uh, think of people like David Katz, uh, Jacob's father, and some of the people that really were kind of the pioneers in this area, and I just uh, think a lot about them um, as we uh, kind of dabble in this uh, science today here. So want to want to just at least acknowledge that. Um, I have the great pleasure uh, through the Northern California Water Association to kind of work for this wonderful region uh, from Sacramento to Redding, Coast Range, Sierra Nevada, that whole uh, amazing uh, Sacramento Valley. And uh, that's just a, a real uh, honor and pleasure to be able to do that. And obviously the one thing that we're uh, continually learning from folks that we've heard this morning and as others is that this idea that we really, if we want to have a functional Sacramento Valley, we really have to have that healthy landscape and uh, river system, and I think we're all working on that. We've seen today, obviously, the food production. Uh, you've seen the slides on that. Everybody has talked about this in their own way, um, and we've seen what that uh, matters. And then this slide, I know, uh, has been inspired by Lewis Baer, um, but I think really kind of captures a lot of what we're trying to do here. We're just trying to provide for some healthy fish um, along the way and just really want to capture that. So I just really want to acknowledge the hard scientists who've been really working on this and uh, really kind of informing all of us. So kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, you maybe, maybe talk a little bit more about some of the social sciences, which I think are obviously equally important to, to making all of this work, is the idea that you've seen earlier, that we have this historic floodplain. And uh, this is what it used to look like. We've seen that. We've seen the numbers 90 95%. And, of course, we know, know that that uh, looks something a lot less. And so I think our challenge here is how do we uh, really restore this uh, floodplain function in the Sacramento uh, Valley. And I, I think that's really what we're trying to do is how do we scale this up? How do we bring this to scale? 
And so I'm going to go through, if I can, all the uh, pronouns or whatever they're called. I'm not an English major, but uh, lots of uh, the questions and see if we can't kind of almost summarize, distill down kind of what we're trying to do here. And it always starts with kind of the why question, right? And that's really, again, this idea that we want to bring this region to life, right? I think we're all here to bring this region to life and to have a shared vision to do that. And that life form is uh, the people that live in this uh, community, uh, the fish and wildlife, the whole, uh, the, uh, the food that we depend upon, it all uh, needs to come to life. And I think that's really why we're here today in essence. And it really does uh, go to why we need this healthy river and landscape uh, dynamic to uh, work. And it's a real opportunity we have in this region. The other thing we've learned from the scientists, of course, is that uh, it's really this magical combination of land, sun, and water. Um, it's so obvious in some ways, but I don't think we can say it enough because that's really what we're trying to do. If you don't have that combination, you essentially don't have life. And so I think the scientists have uh, really reminded us how important uh, that equation is. Um, I think the visual imagery, I think the artistry of this region, this is a Miles Herman uh, print of Grey Lodge. Uh, Grey Lodge has been mentioned several times today, and I think it's just a vivid reminder of what we're trying to do here, just to create this amazing place. Uh, kudos to uh, Ducks Unlimited, uh, uh, Bigs West Gridley Water District. Uh, we were up there a couple of weeks ago celebrating the completion of a water supply project to put water out to Grey Lodge, to spread that water out, slow it down, out in this really spectacular place that people come from all over the world. And this is just one, I think, visual example of what we're really trying to do through this process. Uh, the other thing that we're excited about is we're trying to do this as part of a larger approach uh, to uh, healthy rivers and landscapes. The floodplains, obviously, are probably the most essential, in some ways the most critical right now, in my view, but there's obviously lots of other work going on in every single part of this system in the Sacramento River Basin, from the headwaters uh, to the uh, the middle of the system, and all that work is really important, and it's exciting. And we have some uh, documents on that if anybody's interested, but uh, it's not just the floodplain, it's the whole system. And again, that's what the scientists, I think, have told us. If we're going to be successful, well, particularly with salmon, we have to uh, address every one of their life stages. Uh, so the, then the question becomes where, the second piece of this. Um, and obviously, whoops, went too fast. But anyway, we're trying to work on both sides of the levee. You've seen that several times uh, today. Uh, the wet side of the levee, obviously, is where the bypasses are. You've heard a lot about uh, that today. And what a great opportunity we have. These bypasses were one of the most amazing engineering features we've seen in California. The people that designed them were brilliant and way ahead of their time. Um, but now we're reinventing those bypasses for the benefit of this uh, dynamic. We have the dry side of the levee. This is where the farmers come in. Farmers have been farming on this, but now they want to be doing something more. They've been, for the last 20 plus years, they've converted from burning to uh, flooding up for decomposition, and now they want to do more. They want to extend that into the winter months to help with the fish food dynamic, and that's uh, really exciting. And then we obviously have the in-river function. Uh, we've got these amazing uh, string of pearls, I think as Jacob called them, and some of the the uh, oxbows, some of the traditional kind of features within the river system. And it's really that combination that comes together to kind of define the what. And the what is that we uh, have this amazing portfolio uh, for fish and wildlife. Uh, this is where uh, Barry, uh, Holly, the KSN team have developed this amazing portfolio that we now have of projects that we're trying to advance together um, in unison uh, throughout the region. And this is the uh, description of kind of the elements of that uh, portfolio. I'm happy to provide copies to anybody. We're in the process of updating it right now. Uh, but it really is this kind of large vision to show that this isn't just a, a kind of a dream. It's actually people, many of the people in this room and others who are actually wanting to do projects and want to advance that. And that portfolio, I think, is really exciting. The whom, this is the social science of it. You've heard a little bit about this, but we have this amazing coalition, probably the most exciting coalition I've had the pleasure to work with in California over the last some years. And just a dynamic, you've got the landowners on the top of this list, and then you have all kinds of entities of diverse uh, nature that have really come together to work on this floodplain forward and to work uh, collectively towards this uh, larger uh, vision. Embedded within that, we also have this amazing MOU uh, between uh, Northern California Water, the Rice Commission, Ducks Unlimited, and Cal Trout that has really been a catalyst for doing more. And uh, it's these kinds of MOUs that we uh, both celebrate and then uh, think about every day, how do we turn this into action? And these organizations are really on the leading edge of action in the region that is 
very exciting. The how. Um, obviously, we start with this large coalition. Uh, this is really powerful. When this coalition shows up uh, somewhere, uh, people notice it, right? It's not the ordinary uh, kind of dynamic in California water or land use politics. And so I think the coalition itself has a lot of uh, really uh, good impetus to get this kind of work done. Uh, then it really relies upon these active partnerships between landowners, conservationists, the scientists, and it's really that formula that I think we're finding is how we're getting stuff done. And uh, we just need to be doing more of this. And I think as you've heard throughout the day, there's more and more landowners who are becoming part of this dynamic. And we just, if we're going to scale this up to the scale that we all want to see in this region, then we're going to need more landowners. We're going to need more conservation partnerships. And uh, I think that's obviously a great ingredient. Funding. Uh, this is a letter that uh, we sent to uh, Senator Padilla uh, some time ago. There's been uh, probably 20 of these letters in the last uh, several years uh, seeking funding. As you can imagine, when you go to a senator's office in the uh, in a U.S. Senator's office, uh, you know, they represent 40 million people. You know, how do you get their attention? How do you get their interest in this kind of thing? And it's really these kinds of groups that I think really do that. So we're going to continue to obviously press for funding across uh, a whole lot of spectrums from the uh, federal side to the state side. Um, and it's challenging. We all know the challenges of funding, but uh, the good news is we have an amazing coalition. We have amazing uh, kind of a proof of action that uh, I think is really emboldening that. And we just have to keep being uh, uh, more aggressive on that as we can. Permitting, obviously to get this work done out on the ground requires a lot of work. Uh, for those of you who've tried to get these kinds of projects permitted, you know what that looks like. It's a gauntlet a little bit. Uh, anyway, we're real fortunate. Uh, we've uh, obviously had a lot of uh, work going on in the region that has helped kind of pave the way. Uh, we've also recently uh, been working with Sustainable Conservation. Uh, they've had a program for some years called Accelerating Restoration uh, that has been a really effective program uh, to kind of look at agencies and how do we get things done within these agencies out on the floodplain. And so they are now uh, working with the uh, coalition to think about how do we break down those barriers to uh, permitting? How do we expect permitting, all the things that are necessary across both the federal and uh, state landscape. And things like the state's Cutting Green Tape initiative, I think, have been a really good catalyst for this. But uh, those kinds of programs are also looking for what's the next kind of set of actions to be able to do. And uh, this uh, roadmap, uh, we will hopefully see that uh, early next year or middle of next year to start uh, helping us uh, kind of navigate. And for those of you out on the ground, help navigate the permitting uh, gauntlet. And then, of course, the ultimate objective is to have this valley in harmony. That's what's so wonderful about this program as we think about it is folks can farm in the spring and the summer, continue to do what uh, is needed to be do. That's the economic engine for the region. That's the social engine for the region. And uh, those uh, same lands can also be the environmental uh, component in the fall and the winter, as we're seeing. And it all seems to generally work in harmony, and I think that's what gets people excited and why you're seeing landowners uh, take a stronger interest in this over time. And again, it's part of a much larger portfolio. If we're going to be serious about improving salmon runs, the four salmon runs you've heard a lot about today, uh, we need to be looking at this larger approach. And the floodplains are one approach. The similar effort is going on up in the headwaters. Uh, similar efforts are going on in every creek and every system throughout the region, which I think is just uh, real exciting. So for those who uh, haven't uh, been out, uh, one, I encourage folks to get out and see this on the ground. Everybody in this room, everybody here would probably be willing to go out and share this with you, and we can sure help organize that as well. Um, but there's also uh, some amazing films that have really uh, captured this. In fact, there's uh, kind of six films at this point, probably more, but uh, that really have... Uh, have really shown this. And so uh, we can provide the links to these films. They're all done by different filmmakers, which is fascinating. They're all really uh, highly acclaimed filmmakers that have done these in their own way and uh, really recommend these. And I can send that link around to anybody who wants, but there's at least six films that really provide a different dimension to why this uh, floodplain work is just so uh, valuable and why people are so energized around it. The most recent of these is a 360-degree uh, view. Uh, Rob McAllister, who's played a big role in helping us communicate all this, um, has put together a uh, 
kind of a new uh, style of video that kind of gives you a 360 degree view of the landscape and really encourage you to uh, watch this. It has uh, Wade Crowfoot, our uh, Secretary for Natural Resources, kind of kicking it off. He's a big champion of this, as well as uh, some of the others who are making this uh, region uh, come together. So uh, this is one of the films that's brand new and uh, highly recommend uh, that. So anyway, uh, as you can tell, a lot of excitement around this, a lot of energy around this, and uh, I think today is just a really nice catalyst to synthesize the science, kind of see where we have to go from here, and uh, I'm just really thrilled to be part of this and look forward to, to working with everybody to keep uh, scaling this up and advancing uh, floodplain reactivation in the Sacramento Valley. So thank you. Great. Well, um, David, if you want to stay up, um, if there's any questions for David, we can start off with those. Um, uh, Jacob, do you have one yeah, for me? Yeah. David, first, thank you. Um, your ability to bring us all together and keep us on task is uh, amazing. Um, and I think a big piece of that has been the optimism and the, the pointing positive, the vision that you um, supply. And I wonder where you think we go from here. I mean, we know that we've been thinking big. There's an amazing portfolio there, but also at the same time, it feels like we're just starting to scratch the surface. So I wonder where, where, uh, what you think the next steps are. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Well, and I could say the same about you and your optimism and your ability to communicate this is, is so amazing. Um, boy, I mean, I think there's a lot of next steps. Um, you know, I think the inclination, of course, is to focus on funding and permitting and all those things. And, of course, we've already gone through that. Obviously, I think that's vital. But I, I think it's the things that you talked about, and I think it's the thing that Barry and Lewis just talked about. You know, it's really getting the landowner engagement. It just feels like that's uh, really kind of on the precipice. I remember, um, you know, and you probably remember some of this, you know, when Huey Johnson used to come around and talk about this, remember, people thought he was crazy, right? The landowners basically told him to get the, you know, something out of their office, right? Um, I had that experience, so I, I can relate to it. But uh, you probably did too. But I uh, love Huey, but uh, he was definitely incorrigible. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, and that wasn't that long ago, right? And now I think you're just seeing a much different receptivity out in the landowner. You heard about the Butte Sink conversation. Um, I think the Rice Commission program, obviously, is a vital element of that because, you know, we saw that in the rice decomp arena, right? Remember? I mean, the rice farmers fought burning, uh, you know, the burning ban for years, right? And then it flipped. It pivoted, as you would like to describe. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, the rice uh, farmers were all fully into decomp, and I don't see why it couldn't be the same for, for this as well, right? And I think we can scale that uh, 30,000 acres or whatever you're talking about this year up to, you know, 50 to 100, you know, ultimately up to 300 or whatever that looks like. That's what they're doing in rice decomp, right? And that's what the joint venture I know at least aspires towards. So why don't we shoot for the same uh, scaling up uh, that uh, we've done in the rice decomp? And then in the meantime, obviously, this infrastructure improvement that uh, Lewis talks about, uh, to uh, reimagine kind of the system to in integrate the flows with the infrastructure, right, is, is kind of a nice companion piece. And you tell me, but boy, it just feels like there's a lot of momentum on that right now, and we just have to keep uh, driving that uh, forward. So I don't know, those are the two big elements I think of, and we sure welcome your thoughts and any others as well. Great. Any, any more questions for David? All right. Oh. Not, just, a, a quick response, David. Just um, this last week, I had the pleasure of going up with some civil servants who put the last thirty years into trying to get the dams out of the Klamath, um, and I was able to stand with John Bezdek at the the hole in the Klamath Canyon where Copco Two Dam just stood last year in June. And to see that real physical change, to see something happening at a truly landscape scale, the beginning of the largest dam removal in the history of Earth. And I think that much of what we're on, you know, undertaking here is of equal importance and at similar scale. And so sometimes I guess I get, I, you know, a, a little worried that we're going to you know, what are we doing? We're rearranging deck chairs on a sinking ship or something along those lines, right? Decades pushing. 
Uh, and what do we get? We get more reports. And and this week I look at this and I look at what, I just, what, what you just said and I see, oh my gosh, we're on the precipice of actually fundamentally changing the Sacramento Valley that, that fish swim through. And that's, that's exciting stuff. So just thank you and thank everyone else that, that participated in this. And it's a, a real joy to be part of a team. Yeah, great inspiration. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we do have a, a remaining time here. If um, the speakers that are still here, I know a couple of folks had to leave for other things, but if we want to get up towards the front here, we have a few questions from folks online as well as we'll open it up for folks in the room that didn't have a chance to open questions. So if we want to get up there, our mics at the table as well as at the, the podium. So if folks want to get up that way, we can uh, uh, have that uh, be a good way for folks to answer questions and, and continue the dialogue here. So I will. Oh. oh okay. <laughs> don't be don't be shy. <laughs> if we need it, there's another one for folks. So great. Well, once again, maybe it'd be a great opportunity to uh, let us let them know just how much we appreciate the the conversation here today. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists today. <laughs> All right, so uh, now's the opportunity. If you didn't think of it at the time when the person was speaking or uh, didn't get an opportunity to ask them a question, to do so now. So I'll open it up to folks in the room, and we do have some as well online. So I know that you raised your hand earlier, so here's your chance. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a clarifying question. I might just have missed it or misunderstood. Um, I thought I heard that, you know, all the fish that went on the floodplain, they came out fatter. That's great. The fish in the river, they were less fat. Um, but then the adjacent canals and the essentially the areas immediately adjacent to those floodplains, what were those fish looking like? Because I maybe different studies found different things. Um, I assume that's I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it depends. Um, and it depends really on where you're at. In a dry year, the canals are never really productive. Um, unless there's water draining from the field in one way or another, they're just a, a similar to the river. Um, canals that receive water from adjacent lands, similar to the fish food program, we see higher growth rates in there and there's more food and we see that throughout both the Yutter, Yutter the Yolo and Sutter bypasses. Um, but it really depends. I mean, just a canal running next to it without anything is just like a river. I mean, that's functionally what the rivers are in the levee lower system is just kind of a, a ditch that's been dug with both sides. Um, it doesn't have access to a, that food production side of things. It's relatively deep, it's not very productive. And so, but there's times of the year when we see that draining of the adjacent lands into those fields and they're quite productive at that point. We see that particularly in um, Butte Creek slash Sutter Bypass where the Butte Sink, where it dumps into the Butte Creek is very productive for a couple miles. And similar to what the fish food program sees is that we see that productivity extend downstream until it's utilized either from fish that are in there or lots of those floodplain specific tacks that don't do well in the river. So they're there for a short amount of time until they're either consumed or die until the next point of reentry again. So the, they're either really good or really bad. And it depends on what the conditions are. Excuse me. So I had a question as we get to this phase where we're actually operating things like putting a notch in the weirs and, and putting fish food into the river. What is the next big question? What's the next big research question? I think there's some consensus about the value of floodplains, but how do we avoid unintended consequences? What are some things we should watch out for as we try and you know, move into trying some of these things out? Because they are novel in some ways. I'm, I'm going to jump on that one also. Sorry, they, they shouldn't have put the mic in front of me. Unfortunately for everybody, I have to leave here in about 15 minutes. Um, is I think that there is without a doubt we're going to do things wrong. And I think that that has to be okay. And that I think when you start doing landscape scale changes, like we're using our best management practices, you know, the best information we have, 
but we are in a highly modified system that is changing beneath our feet. Like we're seeing different precipitation climatic patterns than we've probably seen before. And I think that we have to be okay with being wrong. And that that's, we're not, if we sit here and study it until we're 100% sure it's gonna be right, we'll be here for a long time. And I think that, you know, both us as a society and as land managers, we learn more by the things we don't do right. We, we, we make, we try to use our best information in that. And so I think these next steps are actually implementing these large scale changes, whether they be the notch in Fremont. And we, you know, as operable as it can be, and understanding when we do those things across a variety of water year types, we're not going to hit it out of the park on the first one. And that being willing to accept that, learn from it, and then make a decision and change what our management action is. I think that those are really where I see this next step is that, you know, I think the science is pretty strong at this point that reconnecting here is, you know, there's, there's things that we need to work on. But I think doing and, you know, doing at scale that is large enough to quantify that action is really important. And that's where I see kind of our next step in this going forward. There's another way to think about that. There's another way to think about that, which is uh, if you want certainty, I can give you some certainty. And that's uh, keep going on the path we're on. And we'll definitely lose winter run. And smelt be right behind it, and fall run will come right in behind that. That the incredible sensitivity we have right now as a society to taking risk, to doing something different, is very likely the greatest threat we have to actually pivoting from extinction prevention to actually investing in landscapes that can recover robust, abundant populations of fish. And that I think we have the tools to do this. You mentioned them already, Liz, and you're right in the middle. It's called adaptive management. It's called the scientific method. It's called having enough belief in those methods to actually implement them at a scale where we can actually expect a population level response. And if we don't do that, well, I, I think we can be pretty certain on where we'll end up. I, I think Jacob was saying the same thing, but the fish are already telling us we're doing it wrong, right? So why are we gonna keep doing it? So I think we need to change. But to me, the next thing is uh, thinking about the fishery investments like we do water supply investments um, or other infrastructure investments. Somebody the other day said, hey, we put in an $800 million overpass and nobody blinks, right? I don't know if you've applied for a grant recently for a fishery program, but they'll, you know, they're trying to up the limits, you know, go to 15 million, but we only have 30, so if you apply for 15, forget about it. Um, <laughs> but we, we can't make those kind of investments anymore. We have to start thinking about them as water supply, you know, investments in our watersheds. Um, and I, cause that's, that's how we're going to get to landscape scale. We can't do it $10 million at a time. The other thing I'll add is we're doing some of those things now, but we're not doing them to scale. Right. So that's the really big effort. And also I think we need to rethink about where we're investing. You know, um, Jacob Montgomery talked about the fish food here is 40 bucks an acre, right? Um, but we have people pushing projects to set back levies, could, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get one acre. And so we're getting benefit from 40, 40 bucks an acre um, that we probably wouldn't be able to realize on some of those other projects. So being smart about where we're investing and doing it at scale. Anyone else on that one? A uh, quick follow up. Um, w w when you're looking at this innovation and you're looking at s s trying new things that are going to potentially fail, um, the value of relationships and cultivating trust, how, how important is that? I know several of you have talked about those relationships as part of your efforts. Does anyone want to take that? Well, so I, I think this is related, but. Uh... You, you can't create change by just bringing an idea that's all the way polished up to either the people that are going to participate in it or the agencies you want to approve that, right? It's not fair to them. 
Um, when you do change, it, it's difficult for everybody. You've, we have to have participation. I think you saw in floodplain reimagine, we have the agencies there, right? We have the NGOs there. We have the tribes there. Everybody's got to be in at the ground floor for you to, to have a smooth road ahead. And so to me, that's all about relationships and um, building that trust along the way. Yeah, I'll just add a thought on that. Um, I think it's been said, but boy, I mean, that I, we need to resist getting caught up in dogma. I think that's obviously, I think, where we get in trouble in the water world. And I think you've heard today from every one of the scientists, right, that this is a scientific process. You learn, you're honest about when things aren't right. Uh, Carson just said it, you know, we're going to make mistakes. Let's be honest about that. And I think that's what uh, engenders trust, in my view. And if uh, folks have other ideas, boy, we want to hear from them, right? That's the, the beauty of uh, science and the beauty of working together is having different uh, perspectives. So if anybody else has a different perspective who's listening and wants to come to this process, boy, we would absolutely welcome that. Another question here in the room? Oh, sorry. Thank you. So I, it sounded like, like you guys were really on the precipice of making really large scale landscape changes. That sounds really exciting. I was wondering, looking back on it, uh, I think it was mentioned, you guys, we heard, we've heard about the fix, but not about the fight. What are some of the things that you found that have been uh, significant impediments to how you've been able to work through this kind of uh, implementation or this innovation? And how much has that changed over the years through your outreach, through your different ways of engaging on this process, bringing in the science, how much has that changed? And what are some of the lingering um, issues that are some major roadblocks towards uh, full implementation? I mean, I'll try. There was a lot there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we only have, what, an hour left? Um, I think, you know, one of the, we're doing something that hasn't been done yet. And I think that that's hard is to bring everybody on board. And I think, you know, I, I am pro Lewis that, you know, there's like this, there's this idea that bringing everybody on board and finding, finding an opportunity to make sure there's a spot at the table for everybody. But I think at the same time, consensus is very difficult. And I'm not sure, and I could be wrong, and may, I get to live in this ivory tower of the university and I don't have to deal with the real world. So um, take that for what you will is that there's always going to be somebody who doesn't agree with the project. And that's okay. I think that's fine. And I think that, you know, you collect data and it might, they might be right, they might be wrong, but as, you know, if you're asking those questions out of the actions, then you can address them as, as it goes forward. I think it's really hard to have one or two people who are able to roadblock some of these pro types of projects. And I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I, am, I am a pro consensus and bringing everybody along, but at some point we have to do something. And, and I think that that's really important to think about like, let's start making decisions that push the ball forward and maybe doesn't bring everybody along, but brings a space to address their concerns and addressing them as it goes forward. But I think that that's, that's really important that we're getting, I think Jacob, I think all of us have said it, is that we're getting to the edge and the precipice is close. And I think that we have to start really doing and then really quantifying those actions, but making sure that our actions are large enough to hit a signal from the noise to address concerns that everybody has. And, you know, the problem with salmon is it's, you know, we're talking decades. It's, if you, it's gonna take decades before we see recovery. And being able to be both proactive and patient is really hard. And we have administrations change, and we have different agencies whose personnel changes. And I think that that's one of the big challenges that we face. But if we could, as a general group, agree that you know going forward, and we are going forward, but it's uh, it's slower than I think we sometimes would like it to be. And I think I was just on a tour of the Kasumnas River. And I think there was some mention of the Kasumnas River earlier today, where there's we the floodplain restoration started in the really in '83, and then again in '95. When the levee was removed on the Kasumnas in 95, it was about a week worth of permitting, and the preserve manager just used a bulldozer to do it by himself. You, just try and imagine a levee removal now. Did 
Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. So I Lewis is going to get a bulldog. And so over time, we've seen this difficulty in making, like, you know, now to do that project, it would be years and years of permitting and modeling to get that done. And yet when that happened in 1995, it was really the beginning of understanding how floodplains worked. And without that being able to go forward, it wasn't perfect. There were lots of things that were wrong with it. And the next iteration that happened in 97 and again 2013 were all iterations on that um, project. But it's the, the last, the 2013 levy removal was three years of permitting and modeling to get done. So you go from this you know, real simple project. And I realize there's lots, you know, the Kasumnus is like this little unicorn and it's a magic place where there's not houses and people and, and we're able to do those things. But at the same time, I think what we learned from that really benefited everybody in the Valley. And that if, as we're going forward, you know, obviously we have to be safe and all those other things, but doing and quantifying is really important. So I, I think um, what we did at 108 when we started floodplain reimagine is we asked ourselves the question that I think Carson was kind of raising and you were too is how do we get it done? How do we how do we move ahead? What's the right way to do it? And so as an engineer, I designed a social experiment. Um, so I think that's got to fail, right? So no, I I think we looked at the culture that David's created in the valley. I think we we. Uh, we looked at the partnerships that we had and the respect for each other across different interest groups, um, building really on a lot of the work DU's done with waterfowl. Um, and then we asked ourselves, you know, a contentious process, you know, how's that gonna play out? It's not like you just say, well, we're gonna do a regulatory process and, you know, you snap your fingers. It's not the way it works, you know, we're, 20 years into, you know, more into YOLO and um, those are hard too. And so the, the one other thing that we have that's sort of an incentive right now that's keeping the valley together and on the same page heading the same direction is that our rivers have a mechanical problem, right? This is, it is a mechanical problem. We created it when we built the flood system and right now, their water supply is being threatened. Everybody in the state of California's water supply is being threatened to try to overwhelm that mechanical problem because the state board doesn't have the right to go fix the mechanical problem. And so that motivates landowners and anybody else that uses water to come up with a solution that fixes the mechanical problems so we can efficiently use water to produce these environmental benefits. And so... That's why I think ultimately, I, I don't, I agree with Carson. Somebody would say no. Mid Sutter had two or three guys that were like, don't bother me, right? I've got the things I'm doing, don't bother me. But, you know, the, the threat of water supply or the possibility of doing something else that added value to their land, those things I think are what's getting us over the hump right now and probably going to deliver. Um, and I think we'll, I think it's going to be able to deliver in a big way. Great. Uh, Bruce? Some more questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, you guys, we've, we've used this precipice analogy quite a bit, but I wonder if, if there isn't also uh, like a momentum that, um, and, the, and the opportunity to leverage, like we have made some pretty significant investments, used Fremont, we are a big notch as a perfect example. So I wonder if, um, your thoughts on the opportunity to leverage that investment to then, you know, really demonstrate the potential value that then builds the momentum to the to the next project, right? And makes it easier to invest. And it strikes me, I know um, you guys talked about with the um, the California rice work. Um, you know, you've now got several years of data, and of course, with the taking three years or more for each, you know. Um, cohort to return, you know, you need that long-term data set. And it just seems like, are we set up to evaluate the performance of the big notch and learn from that over a long enough period to then kind of ride that wave? I'll use another analogy. <laughs> I'll use analogies to answer them. Um, success builds success. And everyone's saying the same thing. We're all, you know, singing in the same choir. We have to go big. Um, and I think that we're on the, on the precipice. We are on the very edge of not just showing that 
if you invest more, you get more. But this is, this is about conservation. This is about truly having both the opportunity to invest at a scale where you could expect, in this case, a population of salmon to respond, but to actually have the scientific tools to document that response, that's the holy grail. That's exactly what we've been looking at in conservation. I mean, conservation has a short history. We've only been doing this 50 years, right? Um, we are really on the edge of, of, of showing that investments in working landscapes, investments in nature-based solutions, investments in reconciling a working nature, a working kind of knowledge of nature into how we manage and interrupt it, they're not just good environmental stories. They're not even just good water stories. This is some of the best investment in California's economy, which is the fourth largest economy on earth that there are. And that's where things fundamentally change, is when we align economy and ecology and we see that they're not inherently at odds, that's an entirely different set of outcomes. And that's, I think, the belief that we're all touching some facet of. Uh, this is what function means, and that isn't just ecological function, it's it's the understanding that both natural and human communities are both dependent on diversity. That it's the diversity of players in our communities that create the resilience, that allow us to respond to inevitable change. And that's what we're on the edge of proving. And that's huge. I'm curious if we have the funding kind of what, you know, the plans to continue the research. I think right now, you know, we're, I think monitoring and research, you know, I think that there's oftentimes the same thing. It depends on the questions that you're asking of that monitoring. And, you know, there are long-term monitoring programs. I see Nicole back there who manages one of the ones that lots in YOLO for DWR. Um, but I think that, you know, we, my group, we're still on, you know, a one to two year cycle, which isn't even a full cohort replacement. Um, and so, you know, I think that setting that up into these programs is really, especially I think of something like the Notch, you know, which is funny that I was so much more negative about the precipice. Jacob is on the like, he's on the positive, we're on the pre precipice of greatness. I, I, I think of this as like we're on the like edge of extinction, um, <laughs> which is, is, yeah, maybe it's both. Maybe this is our biggest opportunity to see the biggest turnaround. Um, and under letting no crisis go unused, maybe this is our opportunity to do that. Um, I'm a little fearful. My fear of being on this side of it is as we have uplisting of species, then the potential take that happens from management actions is more impactful. And that if a, if unendangered species, a single one is out there, then it's a take of an endangered species for one of these projects. And then is that, you know, if you see one, is that a positive, you know, is it a negative to the project or how do we quantify that? I think those, those questions become very challenging as, as we go forward. I think that we as a group need to decide, you know, it's okay to have a, you know, all the rest of them that die in the channel, we never see them. You know, they're not being successful right now, but we don't see them. The ones that we can count are oftentimes the ones that are out of the channel in these projects. And so that's really hard from a permitting and from a management act, um, standpoint. And so I think is monitoring these things, particularly a thing like the notch. Like this is one of the first times I think we have an opportunity to quantify at scale the actions that we're doing. And I think that it's hugely valuable and it shouldn't go un, unmonitored and unquantified. I think it's just such an opportunity that it would be a real shame to not do it in the best way that we can. And I have to, just so everybody knows, I have to go. So I have to go get a wheel bearing changed in my car. Great. Thanks, Carson. Um, we, we do have a, a few uh, uh, questions from our online viewers here. Um, the first of which is um, from uh, Anitra Pauli with uh, DWR. And this is for uh, Alexandra. Um, it says uh, here, Anitra's question, moving to scale, what are the opportunities to have fish leave the floodplain on their own volition? Yes, so this year we um, allowed fish to leave volitionally. Uh, all we did was, was monitor what day and time they left the field and then we would make sure that we got our sampling data metrics off of them beforehand. 
Um, so we did watch fish volitionally exit the rice fields this year. Um, we saw an initial push right away um, as the floodwaters were receding. Initially, we saw a lot of fish exit the fields, and then it really calmed down for the duration of the study. We would get zero to three fish a day exiting the field, and then again at the end, um, as, as another flood loomed over us, uh, we were draining the fields, and that was the big push to get the majority of fish off the fields. So we will be continuing that type of study going forward, but from what we've seen so far, we do believe that fish will exit the fields volitionally, um, and this pattern that we observed this year was not unexpected. Um, some work that Carson and Caltrout have done in the past have also seen similar results with the initial push immediately post-flood and then what seems to be a residency period um, and then a big push again at the end. Thank you. Um, there, another online question uh, for um, uh, Mark. Um, the Central Valley Joint Venture has a plan that outlines what habitat is necessary to support waterfowl and other water birds at goal populations. Habitat required to support populations require a certain amount of wetlands and rice. Do goals to provide habitat for fish take CVJV habitat objectives into consideration? Well, I don't. And you might need to turn that on. Sure. Um, Right now, the, uh, the goals for winter flooded rice, I do not believe take into account the needs of fish. That's my understanding. I'm pretty sure that's the case. That doesn't mean that ultimately they can't. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I think the DU perspective on that is, is that, uh, you know, given our mission, you know, we have a responsibility to look out for waterfowl and our members, the majority of which, the vast majority of which are waterfowl hunters. So we have to be very honest about that. Um, when we see conflicts, we need to be honest about identifying them, but also trying to navigate them with the fish community as well. Um, and that's, that's very different than just saying, look, we demand the status quo. We're going to dig in here our heels. Um, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, the last couple of droughts have demonstrated that we're losing ground in some areas. And that ground's only going to be lost more quickly um, the more endangered fish we have on the landscape. And that only, compounds, that only compounds our water challenges. And so it's in our best strategic interest to, to become involved in fish recovery. Now, again, we have to do that in a way that uh, navigates any threats to waterfowl habitat, but I think that's possible. Um, so that's a, long, that's a long answer to the question, but uh, I, I, I suspect that most folks on the joint venture board technical committees would probably agree with that, knowing that, yes, we have objectives for winter flooded rice, but we understand that we have to build a broad constituency around that winter flooded rice objective if we're going to maintain it in the long term, and that includes the fish community. Um, can I jump in? Sorry, just to add to what he's saying, um, and to reiterate what Carson mentioned earlier, there's significant overlap between the benefits for birds and the benefits for fish, and it would just take subtle compromise um, to make them mesh well together. Shorebirds, I can't speak towards, but for the waterfowl, like we discussed today, um, I think there is enough overlap that we can find a way to provide habitat for both, both taxa. So I think DU has been an amazing partner in engaging with kind of the fish folks that are trying to do this and work on solutions. And I, I think one thing that everybody would like to see, so I don't know if folks know, but there's about 550,000 acres of rice and about 300,000 currently get flooded and contribute towards some of the goals. But if we could use fish food to sort of expand the 300,000 number, or we can focus and make sure we, you know, prioritize the best hunting and, you know, avoid that sort of area. I think those are the things that we'll be able to work together on. I think there's a lot of aspects of um, the fish improvements that work on getting more fish onto the floodplain but don't necessarily change levels um, so i think there's a lot of room between the two to make improvements and to minimize impacts um, if not even kind of grow the you know the opportunity for birds and waterfowl in the 
in the Sacramento Valley. And I'll add that you know, as part of the floodplains reimagine, we're doing that math right now. We've developed these extensive hydrodynamic models uh, over 20 water years, and we're seeing if you know what ifs. How does that impact well, shorebird habitat? How does that impact waterfowl habitat? Seeing what the potential impacts are, and um, and we're doing that math, and we're working with DU and others to figure that out. And shorebirds is a great example, right? So if you you know, there's grading on the land. So if, if the fact that shorebirds need a certain depth of water, well, if the water expands, that depth of water is still there. It's just somewhere else, right? So you're not, you're not eliminating necessarily shorebird habitat. You're just maybe moving it around a little bit. And also, too, uh, the fish food program we talked about earlier, you know, duck clubs are actively participating in that right now. I mean, they see the benefits currently to being involved in that program, and they're signing up, and they're part of the, part of the framework of landowners and land managers who are working it within that program so they can work together just add one thing I, when we say we, re, we respect existing uses so if you're a duck hunter and you're right in the middle of this other fish product project that's one of the things we're talking about right we're not going to wipe out somebody's duck club um, because of their location that's just probably not something's going to happen under flip plane reimagined so it's you can't speak generally with these things and our models let us speak very specifically to certain locations because there are, you know, you only own one piece of land, right? That's your club. You've made all the investments in it. And so we have to be able to address very specific issues um, throughout the valley. Great. Oh, one question over here. Great. Thank you. Um, I think Carson touched on this a little bit before he left, but with some of these long-term monitoring programs for fish and fish food in the regions that we're talking about today, um, with this kind of precipice we're on and, and looking forward to some of these new projects coming online, is there anything from, from your all standpoint um, that we're missing, any like important data limitations that would be useful from some of these long-term data providers? So the genetic monitoring of juveniles is gonna be, I think, game changing for everybody. Um, for us learning, it's gonna accelerate a lot of that. And uh, we, we have a group we call the Bridge Group where we're working with the commercial fishery and um, they're interested in that as well. And so I think that's a real opportunity that'll benefit um, the learning uh, process. Yeah, genetics is absolutely a, you know a good point. Um, some of the science really we you know we're behind on publishing. Um, Carson and and Rachel Johnson and their team are working on getting the uh, eyes and ears work published that you saw. Uh, Caltrout's uh, team really needs to focus on getting the residence time driving productivity published. That's totally legitimate. That said, we have a real preponderance of data showing something really simple. That fish, like every other living thing, you know, like your own kids, don't do very well when they're starved. This isn't rocket science. There's really not a data limitation. There's a leadership limitation. We're at a place where we need to act, and we need to act decisively. And if we wring our hands, we will lose these species. There is a tendency that we see again and again to ask for more data and more certainty. And I'm in no way demeaning or degrading the value of long-term Monitoring of monitoring generally. We do very little of it. It's absolutely necessary. We have to make informed decisions, but we actually have to make decisions too. And not making decisions, continuing on the path that we're on, that's unacceptable. Um, and, and I think that, to tell the truth, the best place to look is not to water, it's not to fish or other endangered species, it's simply to the summer sky every summer. It is on fire, it's full of smoke. We understand the catastrophic consequences of disrupting natural process at this scale now as Californians, simply because the last 10 years have led 
to true catastrophe every single year. And the thing that we might not get is as expensive as it is with fire, it's so much more expensive interrupting the natural water processes. Those are the ones that actually drive the actual economy of California. So that, again, maybe I'm, I don't mean to gloss over the question in the least. We really do need the kind of programs that, that you lead, right? Where we're collecting good information and making informed decisions. But making those decisions, that's the context that I want to bring it back to, to the place where it says, let's do this. Anyone else want to respond to that? All right. There's no other questions in the room. We'll real quickly with the five minutes we have left, a little lightning round here. Five years from now, what is the most important thing that you th would like to see happen in with floodplains? And Lewis, you have the microphone in your hand. I'm going to pitch you the hardball there. <laughs> So um, I hope we're, we've delivered uh, 20,000 acres of floodplain habitat and that we have regular funding for the fish food program. And we have a couple of rounds of data that are coming in um, on that. Um, to me, it's, it's just so clear. This is how fish used to live their life cycle. This is, you know, we had 25 canneries on the Sacramento River. That's kind of data we used to get is, you know, canning volumes and that sort of thing. We had a lot of fish before when we had a, a valley that was producing lots of energy for fish. So I think getting these things done, um, keeping sort of the peace in the valley so people are still cooperative and energized, uh, that would be an amazing five years from now for me. Yeah, good question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, boy, I think I would love to see a deeper merger of the water management and the regulatory dynamic in California. Just feels like that's waiting to happen, it's staring at us right now. And I think when the water management and the regulatory functions start to merge, that's to me when this really starts to, to move forward. That means that the state and federal agencies are fully embracing this approach. And hopefully that will then start to lead to some improvements in the different runs into our biodiversity, all the things that are important to, to this state. I'd like to see a feeding frenzy for fins and feathers on floodplain farm fields. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm an engineer. Engineers come and go. But <laughs> the most important thing, I think, in the next five years is that these guys, Jacob, Lewis, uh, David, others, are still working on this problem because I work up and down the Central Valley, and you just don't see leadership on a, such an important issue as you see in the Sacramento Valley. You just don't. And people who work in other parts of California will, will, will reinforce that. And so I think the most important thing over the next five years is that they get, these guys get to keep their jobs and keep doing what they're doing. Uh, for, for the Riceland Salmon Project, uh, we would love to see as many um, rice farms situated in flood zones set up their farm management and their water management practices in order to enable the most fish utilization of their fields as possible. Um, and we, we also are in huge support of the fish food um, experiments and projects going on. So we'd love to see all of the non-flood zone rice fields, um, you know, utilizing their water the most effectively by helping with their rice process as well as with fish food and just doing everything we can with what little we have. Uh, well, obviously, I'd like to see a flood plane that's functioning on behalf of both birds and fish five years from now. But I'd also like to see kind of a growing societal support for the investments, the water investments we're making on the flood plane, whether that be for agriculture or whether that be for wetlands, that society comes to realize that those investments ultimately benefit them in terms of better water security. I think if we can get that kind of constituency, I think this can really take off. 
Great. Well, thanks to you all. And it, it's not fair to me to ask you that question without answering it myself. And so I, I, I would like to see the, just this continuation and the cultivation of these partnerships and the collaboration that just makes this happen, right? It is incredible the number of partners uh, that uh, are engaged in this effort and the, just that diversity. David showed you the slide with the various logos of entities that are involved in this. And, you know, today it's example, you know, with just everyone that's online here watching this, as well as those of you in the room. I mean, we've uh, got folks from the, the various agencies, both uh, water management and the fishery agencies, state and federal. You've got NGO partners in the room. We've got representatives from uh, landowners here in the valley. Uh, we got Gabrielle with the uh, Lumberg Family Farms and Bruce representing Conway Ranch. And so, I mean, there's just some people that are doing incredible work here and are all trying to figure this out. And I think that that's, that gives me hope and that in the five years as we continue to grow this, uh, I think that that, that uh, makes me more of an optimist than a pessimist. Who knew that the floodplains uh, were, was a personality test as well? So uh, we're... Uh, um, we're uh, doing 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 good stuff. So I I just want to thank everyone here uh, for giving us your time today and uh, uh, allowing us to kind of walk through some of the stuff that is happening here. Uh, there's going to be the, an opportunity. Uh, the link's going to be available for the video online uh, here within the week. Uh, and if you do have questions for folks and want to send them in, we'll look to try and get them to them so they can answer them for you. But with that, I thank you uh, for your time today and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.